You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Revision Path. I'm Maurice Cherry. And before we jump into this week's interview, just want to remind you one more time about Recognize. Recognize is our design anthology that features essays and commentary from indigenous people and people of color. Now, we've had submissions open since March 1st. Of course, a lot of things have happened in the world since March 1st. Um, So there's only two weeks left for you to get submissions in. Uh, The theme for this year is fresh, and the deadline for submissions is coming up really soon. It's on April the 30th. So for more details, including how to submit your essay, make sure you visit recognize.design, and I'll put a link to it also in the show notes. Now let's talk about our sponsors, Facebook Design and Abstract. Facebook Design is a proud sponsor of Revision Path. To learn more about how the Facebook Design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. This episode is also brought to you by Abstract, design workflow management for modern design teams. Spend less time searching for design files and tracking down feedback, and spend more time focusing on innovation and collaboration. Like Glitch, but for designers, Abstract is your team's version control source of truth for design work. With Abstract, you can version sketch design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to all specs all from one place. Sign your team up for a free 14-day trial today by heading over to www.abstract.com. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Dallas-based UI designer and serial entrepreneur Desiree Gibbs. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. So I'm Desiree Gibbs. I am a UI designer located in Dallas, Texas. What is the Dallas design scene like? I'm curious. Ooh, in some ways, it's very large. In some ways, it's very small. <laughs> I would say that it's innovative when you meet the right people. Very inspirational, again, when you meet the right people. But otherwise, they do a lot of different work, sometimes hidden behind the scenes, sometimes at the forefront. It's pretty much a huge mixture depending Mm -hmm. on your immediate circle. Do you find that it's more like tech oriented or more like artsy? Hmm. I would say a little more artsy. Okay. But now that tech is pretty much booming, there are a lot of large companies that are trying to add their headquarters to Dallas. It's starting to turn a little more tech. Mm -hmm. um, Now that those, those companies are relocating and adding new offices out here. I haven't seen that change much yet, but that's definitely something on the agenda that's in the near future. Okay. And now currently you're working at City, is that right? Yep. Tell me what it's like. Like what's your regular day to day like there? And and I'll mention that we are recording this. It's March seventeenth and we're recording this. So mm-hmm. we are in the midst of a global pandemic <laughs> um which is causing a lot of companies to have to now shift to working from home for a lot of their workforce. But as mm-hmm. much as you can talk about, like tell me like what it's like working at City. So before this all happened, City was really interesting to me because a bunch of us were hired at the same time. So there was a lot of noobs hanging out together, which Mm -hmm. is awesome because then you're all on the same page. You don't know anything. (laughs) So in the beginning, it was a really cool mashup of getting on board with how their culture is, as well as like kind of forming our own little groups and getting to know each other since everyone's new. From there, once we've kind of split up into our teams or our lines of business, they like to call them domains, we really just learn our team really well. Luckily, I'm on a team full of nerds. (laughs) Being a nerd, that's awesome. All pretty artsy nerds, pretty like Star Wars, sci-fi, some sort of tech nerds. So we all really get along really well. I never would have thought I'd find a team like that in a place as corporate as city, but alas, it does exist. (laughs) So for me, that was a really, a really happy thing that kind of blew my eyes open about city, especially since I used to work at 
the Beck Group. The Beck Group was a really corporate based company. It built like half of Dallas. So it's a very old company as well. So I kind of was expecting City to be just as as corporate like, you know, very straightforward, but they are quite the opposite in all the good ways. <laughs> nice. What kind of projects are you working on? So currently I work with some of our partner work. I think like companies that everybody knows about, like American Airlines, I and mean, we have a card with them and then newer partners as well. Well, that I'm pretty much excited for. I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention them, so I'm not going to mention them, but okay. <laughs> um, there's some small hosting type companies that I'm really excited to work on as well as internally, we have some products that we're opening up, some new things, some old things. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing right now is like updating new products to match a new look, really. Cindy's been around for quite a while and they're looking to revamp their look. So it's an exciting moment to get to be on a team that kind of just pulls open the curtain for a new design for an entire company. So that's pretty much where we're at right now. Nice. Now, as, as I did mention, you know, we're recording this during this time where a lot of companies are now basically mandating that their employees now uh, mm-hmm. work from home because of COVID-19 slash the coronavirus. It's caused, I mean, what I can really only describe as massive social, political, commercial, and financial upheaval in general. <laughs> How are you feeling? It's kind of weird for me. And I would say, even though I'm an ambivert, when I'm working, I like to work where, like physically where I need to work yeah. because of the environment. The environment is really important for me to make sure my mindset changes. So, and the people I'm, I'm working around, like it's, my team is really cool. And so you kind of miss those like small conversations that happen that, that kind of add a touch to whatever you're working on or even just your mood in that specific moment. And so now that we're digital, we completely miss that, you know, that just so happen to walk by moment or that random foosball game that helps you de-stress. And so now it's it's like I'm sitting in my <laughs> in my room on my couch because I don't have a desk. Thankfully, I have Wi-Fi and a TV table I can pull out and like kind of get settled into a workspace. But it's a little odd. Yeah. It's definitely different in in that, like I said, I mentioned to a couple of people outside of work too, that it's different even when I'm off work. Like mm. I'm used to a routine and routine is very important for me. I'm very, I'm a very um, methodical person when it comes to things like that. And so when I get in a routine for work, that's how I, I know what to expect every day. Yeah. And so now it's kind of an adjustment to create a new routine to get my head into the work mode as well as my surroundings as work mode as possible to make sure that I'm productive and still be able to reach out to my peers and my coworkers to get feedback and check-ins. So it's a little weird. Are you finding that the team is also kind of going through that same, I guess that same change where it's like, Mm -hmm. now we're working in an office together. I mean, you mentioned this is a, a group of people that you really like, and now you're all at home working yeah. like how has the team kind of been doing i don't think any of them like it really yeah um, and i'll say this because so city actually implemented a alternate work routine to where one team they split the company in half pretty much and split certain teams in half and team a would come on one week team b would be working from home and it would switch every week mm-hmm. so we had only gotten about two weeks into that before everybody was just like, let's just stay home. I and mean, even during that week, people were like, I don't know how to handle this. This is weird. <laughs> the building feels like a ghost town. Some of the people on my team, they're socializers. So they need that people on people interaction. And it's hard to work at home in an environment you're not used to working in and being dis- either distracted by people who sound like they're having fun outside. Cause you know, here, sometimes some kids, some families, their kids are on spring break mm-hmm. and those spring breaks are actually being extended because of, to prevent the spread of the virus. Yeah. So it's actually going to be two weeks of kids spring breaking. <laughs> so it's very odd. I don't think any of us really like it all that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've closed the schools here and 
I've heard, I don't know, it hasn't been super noisy. My apartment overlooks the pool in my complex. So it's usually only noisy in the summer because like kids are at the pool. Right now the pool's not open, so it hasn't been super bad. Like the play okay. area in my complex is a little bit further away from where my, my window is. But it's a big shift. It's a big change. I mean, one, like you said, for you know the fact that there's kids around because school is being extended for spring break. In some mm-hmm. places, schools are closed, but then also just the adjustment of now taking what is your living space, which was not a workspace, Correct. and now having to like not only sort of convert it into a workspace, but then you have to still be expected to keep the same work output as mm-hmm. if you were in the office. Exactly. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. I will say, too, that in the design world, it's normal to work on more than one screen. Yeah. So while we're there, we're working on three screens and it's easy to be a little more productive because you can easily switch between screens really well. Now that I'm on a laptop, <laughs> it's a little bit harder to navigate. And since I'm doing design, it's it's sketch. So mm. sketch, you're working on multiple screens at multiple times. You have all these layers and artboards. It's very easy to switch between that on multiple screens or even just two screens. So I will say that that's another thing that I know a lot of my coworkers are having, a, it takes a minute for them to adjust to that as well. Yeah. Are you finding that your employer is, is at least sympathetic to the situation? Like, do they, they kind of know that this is something everyone's going through? And so we're all kind of in this adjustment period. Definitely. One thing I really appreciate is that we've actually been having weekly call-ins, like an all hands call-in to where our lead update us on what's going on because one of our locations, our main locations is in New York. Mm -hmm. And so New York has been one of the top states really that have been on the news about the breakout. So from there, they're really sympathetic to people who want to work from home to be more cautious and people who have kids who are out early because of it. So they're able to work from home. And this is in the beginning stages. And then now one thing I appreciate because I also practice it as meditation. So one week for one of these calls, he opened up the call with just a few minutes of meditation, whether you're into it or not, or if you want to try it, you can. If you don't, that's fine. But a lot of people are experiencing a lot of anxiety from other people. And even Mm. if they're not watching the news, they're experiencing some panic or some negative emotion that affects them. So that's one thing I definitely noticed about them off the back is that they're definitely empathetic to the whole situation. That's great. I think that meditation idea is really, really good too, because like you said, there's multiple stressors that are at play. The thing about working from home, and I mentioned this you know, before we started recording, I've been working at home for mm-hmm. a long time, is that it takes a good while to get set up into a work from home routine and that mm-hmm. companies really should not expect employees to f- just like fall right into line. I would right. say within the first month of doing it. It Mm -hmm. takes a while because it's not only a behavioral change in terms of just, you know, being able to focus while you're there, but Mm -hmm. in many times it's also a change of like your physical surrounding. Like you said, you don't have a desk. You may have to get a desk if this is an extended thing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If you're doing something where you're transferring a lot of files, you may have to get a larger internet package. If you have roommates or you live with, you know, elderly parents or something, That's Mm -hmm. another stressor that you have to deal with now on top of work. Work is now not the escape from that. It's right there. And Mm -hmm. if you have kids too, like (laughs) your kids are going to be there with you all day in the house (laughs) while you're working. Like, yeah, yeah, got to, got to feed them, got to tend to them. They're going to want to see what mom and dad is doing and everything, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and also some places just don't have great Wi-Fi. So it's, it's a lot of things that have to go into working from home and it really takes time to get a setup. The fact that so many companies, I think, move to it quickly is good because it did show that, you know, people are taking this seriously. But like, it's a big shift. You can't just go from like in the office on Monday to now being on Zoom on Tuesday and think everything's going to be the same. It's not. And I think Mm -hmm. what we're seeing now, (laughs) especially if you look on like Twitter and stuff, is that people are I guess they're dealing with it in their own way, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. finding whatever stack of books they can make so they can have a standing desk or doing something where they're like drinking during the day. I don't know. Like people Mm -hmm. are coping in very 
interesting ways. Because again, it's not just that you're working, but also the Mm -hmm. other stress of just being in this situation is, you know. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I don't want to dwell on it for this because this is about you. But, you know, (laughs) this is something that is going on right now. And I did want to make sure that we kind of give at least some space for it. Definitely. It gives some context as well. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be working from home. Some of the things I have to do now are definitely dependent on the fact that we're in this situation right now. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to, you know, go more into your career because you mentioned the Beck group. But before that, I want to just go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? So that is a tricky question. And it always is for a military brat. Oh, okay. (laughs) I grew up in multiple places. I spent most of my childhood split between Japan, Virginia, and Texas. Oh. Uh, My dad was in the Air Force. And so my family moved around to wherever he was stationed. When did you first feel like you were exposed to design in a way that you understood it? Man, I've been drawn since I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> I was the artsy little freak. <laughs> I still have drawings from when I was in, man, probably like first grade, second grade, mm-hmm. somewhere in my mom's storage attic, wherever, of me like drawing Sailor Moon with color pastels. Like, I've always been the artsy, fartsy child of the family. Everybody else was way over there. (laughs) (laughs) But as far as design, I knew that design was a little bit different for me, though. Okay. Because when I was in middle school, I used to think about doing code. So where I'm at is very much a marriage between the analytical side of design as well as the artsy, fartsy part to where everything looks pretty or it's coordinated, Mm -hmm. things like that. And so when you were in school, I guess, you know, in high school, you decided you wanted to go to college also for design. Is that right? So, so I actually didn't. Now I think about it. It wasn't really a decision I made. I just expected that that's where I'd be going anyway. Oh, so I actually did architecture first for a couple of years and then I actually switched to graphic design at the same school. Uh, I wanted to graduate on time was one of the reasons and I found that that I really liked. I really like architecture, but I wanted to be a little more artsy as well. And mm-hmm. with design, I actually got to take more of the classes that I wanted to take on top of be a little more creative from the front end of it than I would have in architecture. You would not be the first person that has been on the show that <laughs> that like started <laughs> in college in architecture and then veered sort of towards design. So that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting kind of a, I don't know, maybe there's something about I don't know. Maybe you tell me, like, is there something about architecture that just doesn't lend itself to that kind of more creative design that you do now? Mm -hmm. I would say in the beginning, I definitely thought that it was too analytical for me Mm. with like, I I mentioned that I ambivert, which is someone who's pretty much 50% introvert, 50% extrovert. My brain is also the same way. I use pretty much both my left side and my right side of the brain equally. So I'm complicated in the fact that I need something to stimulate both, no matter what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So with architecture, it was a little too analytical for me. In the stages I was in, it wasn't, it was too far on that side of the brain. So when I switched over to design, I was able to really more or less choose the balance between the two. So that, that I think definitely architecture was that thing. But I will say architecture did help me realize that I do love rules and the rule-based structure organization of UX design is really like, that's where that marriage is for me. That's mm-hmm. that connection from architecture definitely led me to UX design for sure. I was just about to ask if you saw any kind of parallels between UI and architecture, but it sounds like that rule-based kind of methodology is what really uh, works for you. Definitely. I mean, for me, a lot of the way they teach art now in in college and in school is, you know, they teach you the rules first and then you learn how to break them. Yeah. That's pretty much like before I was like, that's BS. (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. But now as I kind of think about design, specifically UX design, as well as architecture is that once you do know the rules, like, once you know how to build a building that's not going to collapse on people, then you can lend yourself to doing the creative, crazy stuff that you want to do, whether it's the interior or the exterior, to be able to do that 
pull out that creative side. So at the time you're you're at the University of Texas at Arlington, what was going on in your life? What was that time in, in your life like? Wow. That was a tricky time for me. So college, they say, is the best time of your life. Mm-hmm. Me, I stressed myself out. So it wasn't really great for me, but it did help me see things in, from a different perspective. I think one thing that I learned from going to school is that not everyone's there to help you, which is a really, really tough thing to learn as you're trying to figure out who you are and what you want to do. And that goes from people I meet, from students to teachers. Like the way college is portrayed is that it's this perfect thing that it'll teach you all the things and you'll get a degree and you'll get a banging job right after. And that just wasn't the case for me. It, mm. it wasn't easy. It was very tough. I also wasn't the, the kind of person to ask for help. And then when the time came that I did ask for help, it was I asked the wrong person. Oh, uh, So for me, it was tough. There were some great things. I do love learning. So for me, learning things from different perspectives and learning about different cultures, which is where that military brat part of me comes in, that I loved. I actually took an archaeology class, <laughs> which has nothing to do with architecture and nothing to do with design, but in some ways it really does. So it was kind of interesting to see and learn all these different things from these different classes and be able to kind of cross them over. Sort of like UX design, like I say, I'm going to keep coming back to that. <laughs> <laughs> the crossover of information, I love reading about that. I love learning about that. So that was the pro of college for me, meeting all the different people, learning all the different things. The cons was like learning my weaknesses, really, in the hardest way possible. <laughs> mm, I got you. Yeah. So what was your kind of first design gig after you graduated? Actually, if we want to count when I wasn't in college, because while I was my last couple semesters, I actually worked in the art, art history office. Okay. Um, my school. And I was actually redesigning their new website, and doing updating their old one for the museum and doing various other art projects within the, the department. That was very diverse, actually, as far as projects. So loving that, I found the next job I went to, which was more of a a startup. From there, I did a bunch of different projects. I can't even, and this is actually after my apprenticeship with the BET group. The BET group was really, like I said, corporate. It was a lot of corporate material, small stuff. I did a lot of production design as well. Mm. So that's kind of why I skipped over it just a little bit because the yeah. pool from graphic design at my school and how diverse those projects were pushed me into Code Stream Studios, which is where I was also an instructor. I actually taught web yeah, code on top of graphic design and design thinking. So whenever I got to do the artsy part of it, I was able to do that and teach that at the same time of teaching web. I would say that was my official first gig outside of UT Arlington because that was something I did for pretty much full time as much as I could Mm -hmm. on top of the other job I had on top of that. And what did that experience really teach you like at at CodeStream Studios? What did that experience teach you? Since I was the only graphic designer there, I definitely learned a lot about what other people think graphic design is. A lot of people think it's marketing, social media, (laughs) (laughs) like Anything that you can think of that's artsy, they think it's graphic design. So I learned that not only was it my job to do some of these things, but also to educate the people around me about what it really was. I'm not an expert at social media. I can create graphics for that and you know create a concept. But as far as campaigns, that I might need some help on. <laughs> so it was really interesting to learn that I can I can create all these things, but a lot of people think that I'm doing 10 times more, like you're wearing these 10 different hats for sure. Mm-hmm. But the depth and how tall these hats are, how much information these hats are full of, I think that's where there's a disconnect. So that was definitely the main thing I learned while I was there. Also, kids are great. I think it's very strange how much we like to put them in a box when it comes to certain things. So 
teaching kids like K through 12. It wasn't just one okay. grade. It was K through 12. Uh-huh. Teaching them really reminded me how much I like learning and how much learning could be fun if it's taught the right way. Yeah. There's really something about seeing how kids learn that really kind of brings that out, I think. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, however you've learned your knowledge, whether it's self-taught or if you've learned it through like a formal program, being mm-hmm. able to distill that and then teach someone else, especially someone much younger, that's a skill in and of itself. But it also, I think, requires a lot of hindsight to be able to yeah. kind of tie those two things together. Because once once upon a time, you were that student that was learning. And so exactly. how would you have wanted to be taught in that kind mm-hmm. of way? I think a lot of it has to do with how you want them to see you, but how you want to show them that you see them. Because mm. a lot of kids get ignored in the classroom too. Yeah, And even like even at this job, it's easy to forget about experiences and people that you, you're not living their everyday life. So while I was at this job, I also thought about ADA compliance. It's not really talked about when it comes to design, like in school, they don't talk about that at all. And when I say school, I mean college. They, they didn't talk about that at all. They say <laughs> contrast and the colors that go together, color theory, blah, blah, blah. But they don't talk about who you're designing for past, Mm -hmm. you know, the normal, quote, normal. Yeah. Don't think about just the normal people. Think about past that. So that's another thing that I thought was really uh, not necessarily annoying, but it definitely opened my eyes up more to, you know, learning past just what they want me to learn, learning past just what they want to have at the forefront. Because there's more diversity than the person who has two legs, who can see all colors and has a, a stable job and two and a half kids and a dog and a white picket fence. Like I think learning in that job, it definitely reminded me of that, which a lot of people don't get. Now, you also worked for a group called the Brass Tax Collective. Can you talk about that? Yeah. This was a really great experience. So the Brass Tax Collective, which is first company of its kind. It's described as design experience agency. Uh, We used to call it a teaching agency as well. But you go in with the concept of learning as an apprentice. You get to explore the different roles within the design industry while working on real client work, but also figuring out what you like to do at the same time. We had a bunch of people from different backgrounds, different age groups, different experiences, And so it was a really great opportunity to meet people who are not the same as you and learning from them and them learning from you. Additionally, learning skills you wouldn't think you would need to learn as well. So we actually had a lot besides the design aspect of it. We had a lot of classes that met outside of whatever we were learning. So if we had a videographer, she would also be learning about graphic design and sketch and how to use sketch and all the other Adobe products that they may or may not use on top of what is service design or how do you run a business and a lot of range of workshops and topics to touch yeah. that you can ever think of. It was really great. It's so, one thing that I wish we had more often. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is something that I've covered on the show before, just sort of talking about how people sort of find their way into the design industry. Mm-hmm. And so For you, it sounds like you, well, one, you went to school for design, but then also you had these internships and apprenticeships that have kind of given you the space to fail in a way. And I hate to say it that way, but (laughs) I do, but I do feel like it's important though, you know, definitely. (laughs) because if you come out of school and you get your first job, like, of course, the expectation is that you're going to kill it. You're going to crush it. But, you know, as you've also just stated, the school design environment and the work design environment are like two totally different things. And so it it takes time to sort of, you know, I guess, steal yourself to what it means to be a working (laughs) designer and what all that sort of comes with. Definitely agree. So who are some of the people that have really helped motivate and inspire you throughout the years? So that is a fairly long list. (laughs) So for me, one thing, one issue that I ran into a lot in both architecture and in design at my particular school is that they didn't really teach about people of color, really. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I was very blind to the representation of like people who look like me who do architecture or design. 
So I was kind of lost, really. I couldn't figure out how to find my design voice without help or without trying to figure out like uh, even other classmates. I was in one architecture class. It, someone pointed out that I was the only black person in there and I didn't even notice that. So, oh, wow. and this was in 2000 and what, 2012, 2013. Mm. So you would think it wouldn't be that bad, but I would actually, was. I wouldn't think it would be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately I would. That's, that's still kind of one of the bad things about the industry is, you know, mm -hmm. Even in this modern state, it's still very, very white. Yeah. So I had that issue. Um, but then one of my teachers, Pauline, she did this. She had this idea to have a diversity inclusion panel event. And she had Jacinda Walker and mm. Gus Granger were two, my two main <laughs> levels of inspiration. Um, because I had no idea. Actually, I think Jacinda actually flew in out of state because she's, I think right now she's in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Gus Granger is actually in Dallas. Yeah. And I hadn't heard of him until the panel. So first experience, first level of definitely inspiration is seeing the differences in how they move in the design world. She's really a huge educator and advocate, which I'm passionate about that. And I'm still learning more about that. While Gus does a lot of design, he's a chief creative officer. So first two levels. And now today, I would say inspiration, pretty much every Black person I meet <laughs> who's a designer, because we all have very different experiences, but also similar experiences. And I've been meeting a lot of people at uh, Dallas Black UX, which is a new group that we have here. It's, I think it's only two years old, actually. And through that, I met a few other people who, all, a couple of them flew out of state as well, but Adrian Guillory and Mike Tinglin, I believe they both founded that. And that's something that I frequent now because that's my current inspiration is meeting people like me, younger than me, older than me, because I don't see that anywhere in any of the jobs that I've ever done. I've don't see black people. <laughs> and it bothers me. It makes me feel a little lost. So I kind of had to go out and find them. I don't even know how I found Dallas Black UX, but that continuously has been my inspiration really within the past six months as well. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned Gus and Jacinda, both of whom have also been uh, been guests here on Revision Path. And mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that you mentioned those two, because I do feel like they kind of operate at very sort of different ends, I guess, of how the design community is. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. Gus, like you mentioned, is professional chief creative officer. Uh, he helmed an agency in yep. Dallas called right. 70KFT. I think now he works for a different company called Sixtera, I think, something like that. I don't remember mm -hmm. the, the actual name of it. Um, I actually just saw Jacinda last month, actually. We had our live oh. show in, in uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and... Um, <laughs> I haven't seen, I hadn't seen her. I don't know. God, maybe in about almost a year since then. <laughs> but yeah, Jacinda is someone who is always super outspoken and really is an educator and a teacher. And mm -hmm. I mean, she's doing a lot of great work now. Actually, with uh, I don't know if I can mention. Well, I guess I can mention it. She's <laughs> she's doing a lot of work with the Smithsonian, actually, like with uh, oh, the cool. National Museum of African American History and Culture, like mm -hmm. helping them with different design programs and things of that nature. So it's interesting to kind of see how folks can navigate in this space. And it's good that right. you were able to kind of look to both of them as inspirations because they, I mean, they're both very inspiring. So good Definitely. job on that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Kudos to them. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. <laughs> do you have a, like a dream project that you would love to do one day? Oh man. I come from a family who's all about service and philanthropy. My grandmother is a teacher or she retired a while ago, but she was a teacher. My dad was in the Air Force. He actually won an award for most volunteer hours. I didn't even know that was an award in the military, but wow. he did it. <laughs> so for me, my dream project would have to be something very, very giving. I haven't figured it out yet, but it would have to be so punch in the face, awesome, 
with that level that I would quit my job. It would have to be that good. Mm. As far as a company, haven't found it yet. Maybe a B corporation company might be something, something close. But that's my life goal right there is mm. to work on a project that helps a, a lot of people. Cliche and corny, but well, I mean, honestly, not in this day and age. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Because I think what a lot of designers are starting to see is that the skills that they have can have a lot more use in the world mm -hmm. than just you know an ad campaign or something like that. Yep. So and a lot of people think that's all it's worth. Mm -hmm. is to make something look nice. Get me, get me more views. Get me more impressions. Make me more money and. To me, that's that falls flat on humanity. Like there's so much more you can do with art than people ever mention that, like I said, I want to punch people in the face <laughs> so that they know that art is not just you don't have to be a starving artist. People still say that. And I think it's a huge misconception. And with my rebellious nature, I want to lend my argument to the fact that it can do so much more than that. What do you wish you would have been told about working in the design industry before you started? There are a lot of things. One thing I learned recently from Terrell Cobbs, he was one of the speakers, Terrell Cobbs, sorry. He was one of the speakers at our most re recent Dallas Black UX event. Okay. He mentioned having a tribe. Not, well, not necessarily a tribe. He called them, oh, a board of directors. Mm. People around him that he can go to for accountability, advice, suggestions someone who's going to give them the real truth, no matter what it is. I've never really experienced that. <laughs> so, I mean, for most people, it kind of comes easily if they have a lot of friends or if they have family who are very outspoken, who are very straightforward with them. So I come from a family of introverts for the most part. So that doesn't come naturally. And so I had to learn to, I wish someone had told me to learn to find that. To learn mm -hmm. that skill of like reaching out to people a little earlier um, just to get their feedback and really finding a group of people that support you. Are you finding that now through work? Definitely. It's taken some time to get used to because I don't like selling myself. <laughs> yeah. It feels strange to put myself on the spot and brag. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not my own number one fan, who's going to be my number one fan? True. That's true. And so, I'll tell you a little a little secret too, because I used to be the same way. Like I hated, I guess I, well, I guess you could say putting yourself out there, but like I didn't, like I hated going to events where you had to network because it always felt like I was schmoozing and that it felt mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, inauthentic. Yeah. But what I've come to realize now is that as long as I'm talking about something I'm very passionate about, mm -hmm. or if I'm working on a project or doing a project that I'm very passionate about, that sells itself. And that in turn sells you. I hate to say oh, sells, definitely. but like being able to exhibit the passion through the work mm -hmm. lets people in, in, in a way, you know, it's a good proxy for that. That's dope. I never thought of it like that. What do you do to like get your creativity back? If you're like, if you're feeling uninspired, what do you, do you watch a certain thing, listen to music? Mm -hmm. What's your a routine there? Uh, definitely both of those things. I'm a movie nut. I love watching different things. Korean dramas are pretty much my favorite right now. Actually, really Asian dramas in general. Mm -hmm. There's a very cliche, very standard way of doing movies in Hollywood that I like to divert from that. And Korean dramas, they're crazy on another level. <laughs> so like watching things that are of different countries or different Really, really my number one go-to. Also music as well. Apparently I listened to 55 different countries last year on Spotify. I don't know what those countries are. I thought wow. it was five, but, but apparently that's also my go-to. Another thing I like to do is just to um, read online. There are a lot of random things you can find online from manga. I like reading different manga from different countries as well. There are some good Chinese ones out there. Additionally, recently. I've been into Mind Valley. And so part of my creative process is thinking about what's under the creative aspect of it. And maybe, maybe it's not the creative that's lacking. Maybe it's the structure behind it sometimes. Mm -hmm. So additionally, I'll look for different 
techniques to do different things to kind of get out of my vision bubble to kind of see who some like someone from a different perspective how would they look at it as well and sometimes that can change the creative aspect to better match multiple views or perspectives if that makes sense no that makes sense what do you think you would have been if you weren't a designer definitely a fine artist Okay, so still doing something in the creative realm then. Yeah, I think I would also probably be some sort of musician as well. It would probably be like some weird mashup of both. (laughs) Art can be crazy and non-methodical while learning how to play an instrument is structured and very pinpointed to certain, you know, movements, right? So definitely one of those two. What instrument do you play? I also have a violin. Okay. I'd probably play the string instrument, some sort of string instrument for sure. There's something beautiful about a violin that just irks me in the good way. (laughs) (laughs) Very beautiful sound. It can be high. It can be very low. It can be vibrating. So probably some sort of string instrument for sure. So earlier we talked about interning and, and, you know, I mentioned about how, you know, internships and apprenticeships can sort of be Mm -hmm. these these sort of spaces to fail when you're kind of just starting out, which most designers don't really have in the, like in the corporate workplace. But if Mm -hmm. you knew that you couldn't fail in your professional life, what would you try to do? Ooh, as far as job wise or anything, anything. Yeah. Ooh, if I could do anything. So this has kind of been how I do my freelance, but you know how Issa Rae said, I'm rooting for everybody black. Mm-hmm. I would design for everybody black because I'm okay. tired of seeing these ugly club flyers on my windshield. <laughs> <laughs> so to kind of, I mean, our cultural is awesome. So to kind of bump it up and give it the love it deserves, I would definitely be designing for black people full time. Now, would it just be flyers or were you looking bigger than that? Pretty much everything. <laughs> I would say I would have a, full stack level of designers from engineers, product designers. That would be a really cool place to work. Just the Wakanda of <laughs> design. <laughs> I'm surprised no one has really like tried to come up with that, especially since Black Panther came out. Right. Yeah. You know, who's to say we don't know it exists? I know someone who... That's true. That's true. Brie Moore, she's a fashion designer, coordinator. She's a businesswoman. She's been doing something very similar with her brand. She really, she does work for a lot of black businesses. I think she's ahead of her time, really, because mm-hmm. that she's been doing that since a few years ago. And she's community based as well. So she's really loving, giving the love back to Dallas that it's given her. Nice. So who knows? There, there may be a small little company out there who's doing it already. <laughs> you just don't know yet. <laughs> Who knows? They might be listening. You never know. This is true. <laughs> Keep it where, up. Yeah. You are. <laughs> <laughs> where do you see yourself in the next five years? It's it's 2025. Ooh. Hopefully we have blown past <laughs> this current dystopia. What do you see yourself doing in the next five years? In the next five years, I hope to be the most solidified version of myself, really. I mentioned earlier that College was really stressful for me. Working in an apprenticeship and a a startup both at the same time was a little rough. (laughs) Between being out of a job for six months, I really opened up my schedule to do some personal growth. So as well as professional. Mm -hmm. So since I'm still in like the early stages of that, in about five years, I picture myself to be exactly where I'm supposed (laughs) to be, wherever that is. Still figuring out a little bit, but I know for sure it's in the world of art and design. I hope to be in my tiny house, traveling remotely, educating people, inspiring people to love the earth we live on, on top of doing whatever they love to do. That's definitely the vision I see for myself within five years, for sure. Nice. I like that. Well, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? 
Ooh, so witch work. No, I'm just kidding. So I do a lot of things, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Outside of a designer, I design jewelry as well. Honestly, if you can find me by that page, you can find me everywhere else. I do design through New Black Studio. It's N-U-B-L-A-C dot studio. If you just Google that, you'll find me. That's also my website, New Black Studio. From there, it links to my Etsy page where I sell my jewelry, my Instagram page where I showcase my jewelry. Additionally, actually, those are really the two spaces I live, Instagram and my website. And you say there's a link to the Instagram on your website? Yes. From my about page, it links to so my anything I do creatively, it's under Desi Unique. Mm-hmm. D-E-Z-I unique. And that's that's where I do my art, like my um, black goth portrait series and my jewelry design, the eco-friendly jewelry design, because I'm a bit of a hippie too. So, And then most of my actual UI, UX design is on New Block Studio. Okay. You, you can't leave without not talking more about the black goth portrait series. You you buried the lead here. I want to know more about it. Tell me about this. Sure, sure. So in the beginning, I mentioned I'm a UI designer. If you just met me, I would consider myself a serial entrepreneur. From a very, very personal note, I would consider myself an Afro hippie goth. Okay. And from there, it's pretty much me, modern hippie, tree hugger, plus the goth side of myself. So the alternative side of myself. So from there, I actually designed jewelry when I was in high school and it's kind of grown from ear chains to jewelry I made on accident. Really? I was trying to make a pyramid and it turned into these cool spike looking things that have kind of expanded into that. And then growing into that more alternative lifestyle, I recognized that I was goth. (laughs) And from there, I wanted to showcase people like Black goths get a lot of crap because one, we're black already, but then two, Mm -hmm. because black people can't be goth. You hear that a lot still. Black Mm -hmm. people can't be alternative. Black people can't be nerdy. Yeah. So from there, I pretty much submitted for a scholarship while I was at UT Arlington to do this project. And I ended up winning. And I was able to interview some cool goth people. And I painted a portrait series of them in their cool goth outfits and their beautiful faces. <laughs> nice. And that's on the website too, newblack.studio? No, that's actually only on my Instagram. Okay. The Desi Unique Instagram, I have a little story that's focused on my works in progress as I'm working on it, as well as the final products. So I got six paintings, two per person for now. But that's another project that I hope to really expand on because I didn't get to do as many people as I wanted. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to find black goths in Texas, to be honest. That makes sense. (laughs) The alternative scene here is very white. So I kind of have to do my my research in that. So maybe if more people, you know, they listen to this interview, we can we can get you some more black goths to paint. (laughs) That would be dope. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well Desiree Gibbs, I want to thank you so, so much for for coming on the show. You know, I've mentioned kind of throughout, you know, this interview that this is sort of happening at this really kind of interesting junction For in sure. society right now. But I think also just from hearing your story, like you're at an interesting place in your career right now as well. You know, mm-hmm. you told me this before we started recording that, you know, this is kind of your first like full-time salaried gig. And yep. now this is happening where you've got to work from home and you're trying to sort of adjust to that. And I think, you know, your perseverance, just from what you've told me about your creative background your creativity with this portrait series and with the jewelry designing, you certainly strike me as someone that is able to kind of easily uh, change to the situation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like we're just seeing you get started with what you can do and that, (laughs) you know, granted, and like granted this time, you know, is, is a very weird time for everyone right now, but Mm -hmm. you know, I feel like you certainly have what it takes to, go forward and to accomplish those dreams that you want to make happen. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate the way you put that. I love that. Big, big thanks to Desiree Gibbs. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Desiree and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our sponsors for this episode, Facebook Design and Abstract. 
Facebook Design is a proud sponsor of Revision Path. To learn more about how the Facebook Design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. This episode is also brought to you by Abstract, design workflow management for modern design teams. Spend less time searching for design files and tracking down feedback, and spend more time focusing on innovation and collaboration. Like Glitch but for designers, Abstract is your team's version control source of truth for design work. With Abstract, you can version sketch design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to all specs, all from one place. Sign your team up for a free 14-day trial today by heading over to www.abstract.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Are you looking for some creative consulting for your next project? Then let's do lunch. Visit us at yepitslunch.com. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Our transcripts are provided by Glitch. So what did you think of this episode? Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, or even better, by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I'll even read your review right here on the show. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.